just go back to elementary calculus and review what we learned before and try to generalize the idea here. So recall that. in elementary calculus. To find the minimum, the maximum, and we also have inflection point. Inflection, where the function changes the concavity, we follow it some steps. For example, if you have y equals to, let's say, x squared minus 4x, in step one, we take the derivative of this function. So you have y prime equals to 2x minus 4 in step two, find critical values. Well, to find critical values, you have two steps. You need to set the derivative equal to zero. Also, find the point or points where the derivative doesn't exist. Does not exist. Okay, you take this guy, you set it equal to zero. We get 2x minus 4 equal to 0, so x is 2. Then we say that at 2, you either have a minimum or you have a maximum. Step 3, use the second derivative. This was the second derivative test. The second derivative is equal to 2. Since it is positive, well, at this point, you have You have a minimum at x equals to 2. So use the second derivative. If the second derivative at that point is positive, then you have a minimum. If second derivative is negative, you have a maximum. And then if the second derivative is equal to 0, you need to check the concavity. Check. This is what we did in elementary calculus. Now, in two variable functions, we need to, of course, find the critical values and try to analyze them using the second derivative. But now we have the derivative with respect to x, and we have the derivative with respect to y. We're going to um, construct something that we call the Hessian, and then use that to analyze the behavior of the function. Very good. So now in two variable functions, let z be equals to f of x and y be a function with domain D and assume the function is differentiable. Otherwise, we're not going to work with the partial derivatives of the function. Suppose the second derivative with respect to x, with respect to y, x, y, the second derivatives of function are continuous. On a disk around the point A and B. Okay. We find the critical values the critical values of the function by 
setting the partial derivatives equal to zero by setting f of x equal to zero and at the same time f of y equal to zero. Okay. After finding the critical values, you're going to form the Hessian. Let d be equals to the second partial derivative of f with respect to x at the point a and b times the second partial derivative of f with respect to y evaluated at a and b minus the second partial derivative of f with respect to a and with respect to x and y evaluated at a and b to the second power. So form your Hessian. It's going to give you a number. You have the following scenarios. If the Hessian is positive and also the second derivative of the function with respect to x is positive, then you have a local minimum. Then we have a local minimum at a and b. A and b. The second scenario after forming your Hessian, if d the Hessian is positive, but the second derivative of function with respect to x at this point is negative, then we have a local maximum. A and B. Very good. And the final scenario, final case, if B is negative, then we have a saddle point. Then we say that the function has a saddle point at A and B. Very good. Three scenarios, three cases. If you're familiar with the determinant, D or the Hessian can be written as the determinant of the matrix, the second partial derivative of F with respect to X, the second partial derivative of f with respect to x y, the second partial derivative of f with respect to x y, the second partial derivative of f with respect to y. Now to find the determinant, here you're multiplying f of x x, f of y y minus f of x y to the second half. Note that if you have a scenario that the Hessian is equal to zero, you need to manually take points around the critical point and plug that into the function and analyze the z values. So let us write this note here for you. This is an important note. If the Hessian is equal to zero, then we plug in nearby points into function f and compare the z values. There is no other choice. You can always visualize this and then double check your algebra, your calculus with the graph of the function. Let's go over one example. Our goal is to analyze the extreme values of the following function. F of x and y, is equal to, here we have x to the fourth plus y to the fourth minus 4xy plus one. Very well. So here 
this function is in polynomial form. The domain is all the plane. And this is a nice function. It means that you're allowed to take the derivatives, the first derivative, the second derivative, and you can keep going. So first of all, we need to find the critical values. Critical values. Okay. What do we need? We need the partial derivative of the function with respect to x and with respect to y. Here we go. We get 4x cubed minus 4y, 4y cubed minus 4x. We set these two equal to zero. Very well. They have x cubed minus y equal to zero. They have y cubed minus x equal to zero. Just divide both sides by four to simplify as much as we can. Then we can use substitution. Here you can say that, hey, y is equal to y to the third, y equals to x to the third, and then substitute this guy here. You get y to the third, which is x cubed to the third minus x equal to zero. It's pure algebra. You get x to the 9 minus x equal to 0. If you factor out x, you get x to the 8 minus 1 equal to 0. Well, you have many options here, am I right? You have x, x to the 8 minus 1, which is x, x to the 4th minus 1 times x to the 4th plus 1 equal to 0. You can break this down more. Here you have x x squared minus one, x squared plus one, x to the fourth plus one equal to zero. So these two, they don't give you any real solution. You just set x equal to zero and x squared minus one equal to zero. From this, x is zero, x is one, and x is negative one, going back to algebra. So we have three critical points. We have three critical points. Very good. When x is equal to zero, what is my y? x is 0, y is 0. x is 1, y is 1. x is negative 1, y is negative 1. So here you have 0 and 0, 1 and 1, negative 1 and negative 1. Here we go. We found our critical points. Now in the next step, we need to form the Hessian using the second derivatives. Our d is equal to the second partial derivative of f with respect to x with respect to y minus f of x, y to the second power. And for each of these, we need to evaluate them. OK, it's not that complicated. The second partial derivative of f with respect to x is 12 x squared multiplied by the second partial derivative of f with respect to y, 12y squared minus f of xy. You can use the first one or the second one. It doesn't matter. It gives you the exact same answer. So if I take the partial derivative of the first with respect to y, it's going to give me negative 4 minus negative 4 to the second power. Very good. So, so far I have 144 x squared y squared minus 16. So this is my d. Now I need to plug each one of these into the Hessian and check to see what is the sign and what is the sign of f of 
x axis is again partial derivative with respect to x. So let us form just a nice table to help us keep these in a compact table. So let us start a and b, my point, and d, the Hessian, 144 x squared y squared minus 16, and the sine of f of x and x at a and b. I have three points. The very first point is zero and zero, all right? Okay. D is going to be negative 16, which is a negative. I don't even need the uh, sign for the second derivative of f with respect to x. It doesn't matter. Since D is negative, it means that zero and zero is the saddle point. So your very first conclusion, zero and zero is a saddle point. Okay, what is the next one? The next point is one and one. Let's see, what do they have? One and one. D is going to be, well, 144 minus 16, which is positive. So since the Hessian is positive, I need the sign of the second derivative of f with respect to x. f of x, x, when I plug in one, all right, here I have 12 x squared, which is going to be 12, and it is positive. Very good. So since the sign of the second derivative is positive, it means that we have a minimum at 1 and 1. 1 and 1 is the local minimum. And finally, the last one, negative 1 and negative 1. D, the Hessian, is going to be 144 minus 16, which is again positive. And if I plug in negative 1 here, I get 12 again, which is also positive. So what's the meaning of that? It means that this, this object has two local minimum. Negative 1 and negative 1 is a local minimum as well. So if the question says, OK, what are the actual local minimum? We need to plug those back into the original function. So at one and one, the local mean is z equals to, here you have one plus one minus four plus one, which is negative one. At negative one and negative one, Local mean is z equals to, here you have 1 plus 1, and here you have negative 4 plus 1, which is negative 1 again. Let's try to visualize what's going on here. So here we have x to the fourth and plus we have y to the fourth minus 4xy plus 1. Okay, let me put this in parentheses. Maybe it understands. Okay, perfect. This is how we visualize this surface. As you can see, here you have two minimum, and here in between you have the saddle point. The function changes its concavity, if you want to say that, at this point. Concave down, then concave up, concave up. So this is going to be your saddle point. The Hessian is going to be negative at this point, which is 0 and 0, the origin. 